uh, never fun. We were hoping we would see uh, this gentleman in the middle, Richard Mandela, here in a couple of days after the uh, Kentucky Derby. And uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, Omaha Beach is going to be forced to scratch from this year's edition. Richard, uh, you know, let's take us through the events of what happened yesterday when you discovered his injury and uh, when you ultimately chose to scratch him. He coughed a few times galloping yesterday, which made us think we'd better take a look mainly because he'd had a little bit of a sore throat eight, 10 days before that we had treated and went away. Didn't think we had anything to worry about until that. And when we scoped him yesterday, he hadn't been trapped epiglottis. Can you explain a little bit uh, more, what is an entrapped epiglottis? And you know, he's obviously, he's, he's comfortable. We saw him in a stall this morning. Talk a little bit about the procedure of what he'll have done and uh, a little bit about that injury. Uh, Foster North appeared uh, is the veterinarian that helps me and, and uh, takes care of him, so I'm sure he can do it better than I would. Uh, an entrapped epiglottis is simply the tissue underneath the epiglottis swells. Uh, epiglottis is shaped kind of like that, and this tissue is underneath it, and we're looking this way. It swells and comes up underneath it and then wraps around the top of it. And it prevents the epiglottis from moving, which is very important uh, because it's what uh, blocks the airway from uh, the pharynx, which is where the food would be coming from. So it keeps food out of the trachea, basically, it's one of the things it does. But, but when, the, when a horse entraps, um, it really limits their breathing. It blocks probably about a third of the airway. And in a race of this magnitude, uh, that's too much to give up. So. Uh, the, the only option is to treat it and and medically you can treat these things but once they uh, entrap uh, it's very difficult to treat them uh, medically and you usually have to do surgery the surgery is very simple uh, a lot of times it's done standing uh, they'll they'll go in with an and make an incision in that tissue basically cut it in half it will fall back off the epiglottis and shrink up and disappear like it was before this all started. Uh, it's very unfortunate timing, but like like Dick said, we saw it. Uh, we saw some inflammation in the throat uh, soon after the horse got there, and we treated him accordingly with some throat flush, and and all of that inflammation went away. So we all thought we were golden uh, until yesterday morning. We'll open up the uh, the floor now for some questions to Charlie and Fred on either side, and uh, just raise your hand, and we'll get over to you. Just some general reactions and to, to, to this happening. I mean, I know you dream about the Derby winning it since you were a school kid. I do, and it's uh, it was devastating to be honest with you. Uh, yesterday, you know, I've done this for 45 years, so I've seen the movie and started in it. Uh, you know, that's part of training horses. But I had a nice message from Arthur Hancock yesterday, and he said, Richard Whittingham was 73 when he won his first one. So who am I to think I should be doing this now? Other than the coughing, was there anything in, in his gallop that, that caused concern? Was he noticeably slower or labored? You couldn't have asked a horse to train any better or look any better this whole period we've been here. You know, you've all seen he galloped yesterday. If you didn't look up his nose with a scope, you wouldn't know anything's wrong. But I'm sure by the time he'd hit the quarter pole, he would know it was there. And it would be a terrible feeling as bad as it felt yesterday. It would be a horrible feeling to have him not finish well and know that I was at fault for running him. So we had to do the right thing by the horse and that's give it up and go to the next step. How long does it take uh, them out of training when they have that? How long does it take them out of training when they have this procedure done? I would say two weeks, possibly three, of, of no more than riding under the shed row, and then you can start to train. So Saying that with the triple crown in mind, we obviously can't run in the, I'm sorry, this whiskey's pretty strong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but obviously just terrible timing, because I think the first time I ever heard of an, an entrapped epiglottis was Ali Sheba, but that was between 
like the Ali San Felipe and the bluegrass, and he then, of course. I think Ali Sheba ran in the Turfway Park race, if somebody can correct me. Bluegrass. And was about a month out. Bluegrass, you're, nine you're, days you're, out. You're, you're, you're a reporter, you probably know exactly what it was. I think he was, it was like, about yeah. a month out, and they found it, they split it, and he made the race. Had this happened three weeks ago, Foster could correct me, we'd probably, this probably wouldn't be a discussion, we'd probably be running, but three days isn't enough to do any anything to help it. Uh, Rich, when, when did you call uh, Rick Porter, and how was that discussion? Uh, we had an expert come up and look at it yesterday afternoon, Dr. Embertson from Rudin Little, and he looked at it and said, this man was correct in his assumption and, and we can't fix it and game over. And there was no, there was nothing but agreement with all of us. And I went back to my hotel room and. Sat, sat down, had to gather my thoughts a little bit. And then I had to call Rick Porter and also Wayne Hughes of Spencer Farm, who's purchased his breeding rights. And very fortunate to say that I trained for some of the greatest people in the world. Uh, and their concern was maybe more for me after I got done, it seemed like, than me for them, which doesn't seem right, but that's how lucky I am. Richard, I, I think you were about to address this. Um, obviously, I think the pre this is on the table. Of, yeah. Is the Belmont now the, consideration the, right now? The two weeks off uh, just throws out the Triple Crown. Can't run in two weeks because he's not going to train at all. Can't run in the Belmont because he makes two weeks especially that we didn't run this weekend. So having not run and try to train up to it with two weeks off wouldn't be fair to the horse. I wouldn't try to put him through that. Is there a financial component to this that uh, affects his value with Spendthrift uh, that he doesn't run in these races? Say it again. Is there a financial component in the, the deal with Spendthrift that if he doesn't run in these races you get less money already. Um, Rick gets less money. I, I never saw the details of the agreement. I, I, I do believe there was a pretty big kicker if he won the Derby. So I might have saved Mr. Hughes money. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? This is, um, of course, when you hear people who've been in this game a long time, they deal with these things, but is this the worst you've ever dealt with? Say it one more time. Even in your long career, is this, even in knowing this game as you do and what can happen and how these things can happen, is this your biggest disappointment? I'd say yes, and I guess it's because the Derby is what it is. And this horse, if you all have been around the barn, you can see how special he is. Um, it just seemed like everything was so in line. In fact, I actually had a thought, is this too perfect? Because nothing's that perfect. And we found out what wasn't, so. But it was very devastating. Uh, you know, Beholder, came to Keeneland and got sick and couldn't run in the Breeders' Cup, but she had done so much before and after. I couldn't, I couldn't, I could never hold anything against what happened to her. So, but this is, this is unique. It's the Kentucky Derby. Um, came flying in here like, like we had it written on us and, and it didn't work. So, Mel Studi said it best once when he was interviewed about the the Derby or whatever it was, and he said, I've got a lot of experience with disappointments. This game will do it to you. You kind of addressed this uh, when you said, you know, we knew immediately we do what's right by the horse, but this is sort of an important time in the 
for the evolution and the history of this sport to, to maybe make an address to the general public who doesn't follow this and, and kind of to, to add a little bit more to that comment about <coughs> here on the biggest stage where, you know, maybe the thought is, hey, these people are just in it for, for the glory and the money and all that. Maybe you can say something along the lines of, you know, again, just kind of elaborating on that. We do what's right by the horse. Well, as we've said all along, said it's said every year, when you learn about horse racing, the first thing you learn is the Kentucky Derby. You grow up in it, you work in it, whether you're a jockey, a trainer, a groom, hot walker, an owner, doesn't matter. The Kentucky Derby is what everybody knows. Um, so everybody has that dream to win it. But horsemen care for their animals. And we don't always get the warning. And things happen. But horsemen always look for the warning signs and don't want to do the wrong thing. As I said before, as broken hearted as I was yesterday, I'd be a lot worse than that had I run him and he ran up the racetrack and I'd be kicking myself for ever. Why did I do this? So we all live with that as horse trainers. Again, our players can't talk to us. We have to use instincts, little signs that we see. Uh, hopefully a veterinarian that knows something. <laughs> but, uh, and occasionally things get past us. But we all do the best we can, but it means the world to us to what our horse's condition is. I think that answers your question. Probably more than you wanted. <laughs> Richard, the, with the race being Saturday, will you stick around? Will you watch it? No. I'm sorry, if I was going to be here, but I'm probably going to fly home Saturday. Uh, so maybe I'll get to see it. Um, I don't say I didn't say no as sour grapes, but uh, I wish everybody in in the race the best of luck. Um, the tough pill to swallow yesterday, but I said that to Foster in front of the horse, and the horse looked at me and said, "You think you had a tough pill to swallow?" <laughs> <laughs> Richard, as the, has the surgery been scheduled? Do you know what day it'll be? It's going to be done this afternoon. The other day when you were, you were at, over here, uh, when you were asked about uh, the stress of being the favorite, um, right, uh, you joked about uh, a big bottle of whiskey. Uh, in reality, how do you process this? Are you a man of faith or fate? Or how do you, how how do do you move on it? from this? lady sitting right in the middle of the room, my wife Randy, the most wonderful person in the world. She's been with me for 50 years, married 46 or 7. <laughs> and Sorry. One more thing that I'm very fortunate and lucky to have. Makes it all look well. Last night she tied one leg, one of my legs down to the bed so I couldn't jump out the hotel window. <laughs> She had my arm done too, and I almost broke loose. <laughs> Richard, we talk about the horse's potential, presuming all goes well, and you bring it back for, I guess, the second half of the year. Would you walk down the road to the Travers uh, and, and eventually Breeders' Cup? And what, what is this horse's ultimate potential? Uh, <clears throat> let me say, he, he is a special horse. I mean, you watch him out there on the racetrack. He was galloping one day, and I keep somebody, I forget, I think it was Mike Smith. I said, that looks like Muhammad Ali when he'd go into the ring. He'd just bounce and hardly touch the ground, and float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. I mean, it just, it just said it to me. He is really special. And then the, the kind personality. I never had a good horse like him that had such a kind personality and took it in stride the way he does. So. It's, it's just an unbelievable thing to have one like him. 
but I have not had time to sit down and look at the schedules ahead and obviously what happens today in the at the hospital and the next two weeks will be fit into what I make plans and Saratoga could be a possibility there's a couple races there there's the Haskell in New Jersey uh, the Pacific Classic in Del Mar Breeders Cup at the end of the year is the obvious big goal so we'll find something else to do Uh, where the surgery will be performed? In a clinic or in its box? I couldn't understand. At the clinic. Where you will make the surgery today? Well, the the surgery. Where'd the surgery be? Root and Riddle. Root and Riddle. Yeah. In Lexington? Yes. What's his name? Dr. Emerson. Rolf Dr. Emerson. Rolf Emerson. Uh, Richard, you said uh, Arthur Hancock reached out to you. Bob Abbott said this morning he talked to you. I'm sure a lot of people have reached out to you. Anybody you weren't expecting? Anybody surprised? Surprised you that reached out to you? No, no a lot of people did. And, I, and I've got to say, very appreciative of seeing like a lot of people rooting for me here all week. Um, my wife's got a little bucket. She'll walk around if you all throw a donation in there and <laughs> help us get home. But uh, it, it's very heartwarming, the good feelings that people have for us here. And thank you for them. Don't forget the bucket. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Richard. Thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Northrop. And uh, all right, we'll, we'll derby.